Hello everyone and welcome to the Board Game Geek Show for March 2024. Today we got Derek in for Candace, Eric Martin, and Stephen Bonacore. Um, it's been an interesting month. Everybody's been busy having <laughs> all kinds of stuff happening. Uh, and travel. It's that uh, awkward time that, of the uh, year where everyone's travel schedule is it's exactly. hard to get everything to... <laughs> well, Eric Eric has a tiny window too. He'll be gone for a little bit and then Steven just got back from something. I did. I just got back from Dice Tower West uh, and I am finally was going to be at home for four straight weeks until the gathering of friends where I'll see most of you guys, right? But I got to drive... Drive. I got to go up to New Jersey for a, a quick visit to, to see the family. So, yeah, it is. It is one of those weird times where, you know, travel is like should be going down, but all of a sudden, you know, things are popping up. Well, it's all building up. I mean, uh, you didn't go to Gamma, right? No, I did. I, you know what? I decided I I'm going to go did. game. <laughs> I'm going to go game at Dice Tower West instead of like, you know, probably like working a little bit at at uh at uh, gamma but uh you know i really had no big reason to be there anyway zev was there for play to z so it was 100 yeah, percent fun we actually played uh ascending empire zenith edition on our uh live stream with dave which was awesome yes i know you did thank you very much <laughs> it was really good <laughs> Great. Uh, and, I, and i did i said during the game as we're playing I'm like, oh man i'm gonna have to back this i did back it uh, <laughs> which i'm happy to uh, and I, there's others that won it. I hope you guys have a uh, exactly money. raining money. Uh, I hope <laughs> yeah. I hope you guys have a pledge manager so I can add another copy. Oh, yeah. oh uh, absolutely. I, got, I have a, That'll a, be coming up soon. a friend who I told about it and he's excited about it too. So I'll, I'll probably get him a copy. Um, well, cool. Uh, so I just got back from Texas Pinball Festival. So I was in Dallas, which was really fun. Uh, it was our second year going to that. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but let's start with some news, Eric. Do you have anything to tell us? Sort of. I mean, what's weird is I attended Gamma. The I went to the Gamma Expo for roughly three and three quarters days. And I took just a mountain of notes in this. This book is still like I've been pulling out pages as I write them. Breaking news, maybe, with yes. Eric Martin. <laughs> well, less breaking over time, because I've been yes. writing posts pretty much daily since March 9th, and I already have things scheduled through April 1st. Wow. And I'm still not done. So that's like... That's all for the lot. Gamma Trade Show announcements? Wow. There's a couple of things in between, but okay. pretty much one post a day on Gamma. And it's just... cool. It's kind of astounding because it's different from a, uh, a open to the public convention because this is all business, right? Retailers, publishers, distributors, media, uh, all sorts of other people doing stuff. And there's a little playing going on, but it's not like there's a game that sort of catches fire over the show and then everyone right. talks about right, it. Right, right. Everyone has to go try it out. It's much more like, there's a game night each night from nine to 12. And there's some, a few other opportunities to play things. And like, you'll try something maybe for 10, 15 minutes. And you're like, okay, I get the idea. Because a lot of it is, is retailers want to know what they should carry in their store. So they don't necessarily have to play the entire game. They want to know which of my customers will this appeal to, if any, what games is it like? How would I talk about this game? You know, people ask questions about it. Do I know what it is? And I can compare it to something else. It's all very much focused on them knowing what to carry and sell or a licensor knowing, do, do I want to pick this up for the Portuguese market? Right. So they will probably, you know, I'll take a copy home and we'll play it more later and blah, blah, blah. Like you're very rarely playing a full game unless it's something 15, 20 minutes short. So nothing really catches fire also because the publishers in the game night are not there every night. Yeah. So I took tons of notes. I've written about a mountain of new games and uh, I already mentioned in a video I did just on my own, just like looking at all the games coming out, I kept seeing mostly lots of tinier games, quick playing games, lots of $20 games. And again, maybe it's just what I'm looking for and what I'm seeing because if you're doing Kickstarters, often you're not at Gamma because they're not your audience. They're your audience only once the game is produced. And now you can possibly put it in distribution or sell direct to retailers. So all those companies with giant 
Kickstarters, they're not talking at Gamma. So Simon, for example, did a presentation and they presented three games that they kickstarted, I think last year or possibly even 2022 that are now hitting retail. And my notes, essentially, I was just making notes about like the music and just random thoughts going through my head. Like I've already, I've written about, I've written about these games. So I didn't have much to say. Uh, they have very good presentations, but again, it's for a retailer audience saying, this is what you're now can sell to your customers. So it's a very different feel. Uh, I don't know. I got a, I got a good taste. Again, this is not news, but I got a good taste from talking with a licensing agent who just travels the world. He was going to a show in Singapore after this. And then there was like another show, I think in South America, he was going after this where he is an agent for publishers where they are telling him what they want. And he's kind of like this first pass looking at all these things and can then deliver it to that publisher rather than a publisher being flooded with just whatever. Uh, I don't know, Steven, you, maybe you talk about that experience of like being yeah. flooded with whatever versus <laughs> you're you, right. You're, 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 a, you're doing a crossover there. Cause you, you went to a business show. So you're doing a crossover kind of with like my world of, of talking about the business. And of course my, my life of, you know, licensing things, but uh, there are a number of those people and some people that we know collectively, Lisbeth, I don't know if we want to mention the full name, but you know her too. She's very famous in the industry. She goes around looking for to, to pair up games for, uh, for people, uh, other publishers. So there's, um, there's a big demand for a publisher, you know, wants certain things and they don't want to have to take a million meetings. If somebody can be out there and can find things, then I, they would be rewarded with some kind of finder's fee. And I never had that kind of agent. I usually just got flooded and had to do whatever I could do to weed through it. Uh, but um, it is it is a it is something in the uh, in the industry that you could possibly do. Yeah. I, this guy as well, he was like representing Vietnamese publishers and lots of companies I don't know about, I haven't heard of, like they, they're not active well, on BGG. I'm really. sure Reiner Knizia knows he's probably published a game with them, right? That's right. He's, he's got a few people who work for him who are looking Just at those markets as well. But it's, it's you know, it, there's so many publishers who have looked to the Japanese market to try to find the next love letter or of course the next trio, you know, the next scout, you're trying to find all this sort of stuff. But if you're competing with a ton of people, that makes it a little harder and you go to a fresh market and maybe there's something there. So it was really interesting. I talked with someone who's going to write an article about the Vietnamese market because he's living in Vietnam and it's an extremely different market. He was showing this card game with this box that was like barely held together with you know, super wavery paper because it's just meant it's like inexpensive item. Just try it out there. And it's like $6, 50 cents, you know, th there's your game. And of course, who knows if someone will license that, but it's hard to, to pick out one thing because uh, again, it's like, okay, Renegade is coming out with a 60th anniversary edition of acquire, you know, I know that's it's exciting. Like super fancy with poker chips and all that's yeah. very cool. Um, I don't know if that has any buzz on the market or if most people care, or it's just all like old guys. My gosh. Hey, uh, hey. Like, I don't, I don't know, where, I don't know uh, where name calling, rude. Yeah. Ageism. Yeah. Ageism in this industry. Yeah. Hey, is, you kids, get true. off my lawn. I could talk I, and say I mean, that I, they, I, they also I, had a Robo Rally Transformers edition, right? And so, again, there's so many of these titles that are hitting this nostalgia market where it's for middle-aged people who now have a ton of money and can buy these things. Maybe you wanted a Transformers game when you were young, and now here's like this special version that's, I think, 45, 50 bucks. I played a Transformers board game I found when I was like nine years old at a thrift store. So it was, you know, for me being nine, it was that much older of a game. And it was, as a Transformers kid, it was very disappointing. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so you have my attention with Transformers Robo right. Rally. <laughs> yes, you have miniatures, but they only stay in bot form. They do not transform into vehicle. Oh, form. oh I was about to ask. Bigger. I was like, do they at least yeah. like condense down or anything? No, okay. That would be a way more expensive game, I think. But you do transform them during play. 
because some parts of the board are accessible or get a benefit when they're in vehicle form and some in bot form. And so you're switching at the start of each round depending on where you want to go and what you want to do. And yeah. if you want to shoot people, because the bots shoot people in three directions versus normal yep. robo rally only straight ahead. So I, I'd, I'd like I'm to in. quickly I'm in. address. <laughs> I'd like to quickly address the, you know, you mentioned about acquire. Is this only like a nostalgia thing? I don't think so. Cause acquire is just still a great game. It's probably it's Sid Saxon's pinnacle game, you know, great American designer, Sid Saxon, the old school designers. Um, and it's still being played. It's, it's a game. It's a, it's a ring game at the world series of board gaming, which I am involved with, but it's a great, it's, it's probably the best, arguably the best stock market game out there where, you know, you have to, you're, you're collecting stock from various companies and you're trying to figure out when's the right time to dump, when's the right time to buy or sell or this or that. I, I find it fascinating. Um, I think it could still be, you know, a, a 60th anniversary edition that costs a hundred dollars. That might be a much for the current market of people who are like, what is this game? But um, just having that game in print again by Renegade, I think is a great thing. For sure. That's because you're an old guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we featured it on game night, and I think we might have been too soon since there's an, a deluxe version coming now. So darn That's it. Right. That's right. Uh, well, yeah, hey, yeah, Stephen, do you have, I, I'm excited. Stephen, do you have any industry mm. news for us? Absolutely. It was actually a very big uh, month, and certainly the last week or so uh, for industry news. And the one, the, the most fascinating one, I think, of all was the fact that CGE, right, that's Czech Games Edition, the publishers of Codenames, among many other great games, has acquired a board game and puzzles factory in the Czech Republic. Wow. So this factory was um, co-founded by Ludofact, in fact, in and Ludofact being the largest German and maybe the largest board game manufacturer in the world. I'm not sure, but the largest certainly in Europe. They founded it, uh, co-founded it in 20, 2004, and it's 30 minutes away from the CGE's Prague office. And of course, it's now going to allow the company faster time to market, greater quality control, and all those kind of things. I think the bigger story here is that CGE can afford yeah. to buy <laughs> a factory, a board game factory, which Hasbro does not own any board game factories. They did at one time. They did own a manufacturing facility in the Northeast, in Massachusetts, I believe, near their headquarters there. But CGE has just bought a board game factory. I found that amazing news. Codename is money. Other things? What's that? Codename is code money. money. Yeah. Code names be, I mean, be money. Well, also, I, I believe there was something as well with that where they're not only printing their own games, but of course, sort of setting up as another manufacturer for whoever wants to come to the Czech Republic and, and oh, absolutely. Games printed in Germany and all sorts They'll of things. They'll certainly, you know, um, uh, games printed in the Czech Republic, in, um, uh, in Poland. Um, I'm trying to think of other European countries that are not Belgium. Germany. Belgium does a little, uh, but I'm thinking of the Netherlands. The Netherlands. Yeah. But there's an, at least another one, and I can't think of another uh, that, that also does th those, you know, those non like G7 countries, right? The ones that have the big economies, with, which are more expensive to work in, of course. That's right. just the, that's it, right? Working in the United States, uh, manufacturing is all, nigh impossible. You do, they do a little bit in Europe. But um, so, now, sure, they're the CGE, even though they own it, I'm sure they're going to still solicit, um, you know, business because they're probably, I'm sure they cannot keep that factory 100% engaged. Sure. So they will, they will go out there and say, hey, you know, other countries, publishers. companies around the world, publishers around the world, come on here and we'll, we'll, we'll work with you. And they'll be price competitive. Well, the good thing is, is they have an idea of what good quality is too. So... I mean, and it was Ludafact, so it's already, I'm sure everything's yeah. already pretty great there. Um, right. I mean, I know Ravensburger prints in uh, Czech Republic. I don't know who yes. they print with. Um, right. But yeah, it might have been printing with them. So the next thing I have here is that we have two reports about bankruptcy. 
one bad, that's usually the case, and one a report that's good. Let's talk about these. The first one was that Ninja Division uh, has declared uh, Chapter 7 bankruptcy, which means they are shutting the doors down. There's, they are huh. going away. Their big thing, uh, their biggest game, I think, is Super Dungeon Explorer. Dungeon Explorer is that, yeah. that is it? Right? Um, they had a lot of troubles um, over the last several years. They had um, huge liabilities uh, in the millions of dollars. Uh, many creditors, uh, you know, the article on, uh, on Board Game Wire cites 49 creditors that were coming after the money that they were owed. Wow. For all of their all of the stuff, I mean, that could be anybody from you know me handing them some money, maybe to you know they have to pay bills for printing and logistics and all the big the big ticket items. But this is a shame um, because they're also leaving a bunch of people in the lurch uh, for some uh, uh, crowdfunding that never got never got fulfilled. And this brings us to a good time to mention to everybody out there. That yeah. crowdfunding is not a pre-order system. Right. You may or may not get your game in the end. Go with you know, publishers that have good track records and stuff like that. But So this is obviously not a good thing. It's a shame. Super Dungeon Explorer had some buzz a while back. So it's, it's a shame to see that it's um, going away. On the other hand, we have some good news. We reported, we might have reported it here. I certainly reported on Board Games Insider that Haba filed right. for bankruptcy protection uh, in Germany. Uh, Haba being the premier, I think you guys would agree, uh, manufacturer, publisher of children's board games, right? And I say premier not only because they sort of have that market, I say because they're games that you and I would play with our kids, right? I mean, it's not a game you could go to, grab it off the shelf. Hey, Lincoln and Derek and Eric, let's go play this Hobbit game. Just, no. I just ordered another copy of Hamster Roll. Come on, I play that with adults. It's the best. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> oh. The games that they can put Is out. Is that Zock? Is it Zock? That's Zock. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but I'll still play kids' games. Or I'll play Iquazu. That's Haba. So, so Haba, you know, filed for bankruptcy protection, but they were reorganizing and they have reorganized. They've, they've had to lay off about 600 people, but they are coming out of uh, uh, bankruptcy right now. Um, they're exiting the insolvency proceedings wow. under self-administration. That's kind of fast, this isn't it? it? He did, yeah, because this whole thing happened. I think that the original report was um, during the fourth quarter of last year. So it was a very quick turnaround, which is great which means that they can come out in a good way. So um, this is really, really good news. You mentioned the word bankruptcy in an article, not usually good news, but this is great to hear for the game industry period. And of course the younger portion of the game industry. So I was excited to hear about that. Cool. Um, let's see, what was that one that uh, I said that I was, oh yeah, the miniatures market, right? Miniature miniatures market. market. Yes. I don't know miniature market. I always put an S in there for some reason. For some reason, I don't. I, I didn't even one. have it. Didn't even have it on my list. I actually it must have accidentally dropped it off. But um, I do have more information on that because we did report on that on Board Games Insider that there were some uh, during you know Asmodee has been going through uh, restructuring too, not bankruptcy restructuring. Just they have been laying off quite a bit of people. Lots of pressure from above, right? Embracer Group, the parent company of Asmodee. Um, has been in some financial troubles. Now, they're not going insolvent or anything like that, but they have not done nearly as well as they had hoped to. And that all started uh, about a year ago where a huge amount of money in flux was, was supposed to come in and it didn't. So they've been going and pushing everybody below them, all of their subs, lay off people, cut costs, do that. And you know what? Frankly, Asma, they needed to do that after all the acquisitions that they did over so much time. So they've been going through some of that. Asma Day announces that they are selling Miniature Market, which is really weird, right? So this, this is the largest online board game retailer in the United States, uh, probably the world. I would go out on a limb and say, uh, I mean, I'm, Amazon might also be you know, sure. running, r racing for that. But for, for them to say, well, we're going to exit just this portion of the market. And they do still own 
Philibert. I believe they have, right, Philibert, which is both a distributor and a retailer, and it's all this other. Philibert's a very big uh, conglomerate out in France. And the French market to Asmodee is quite different than all their other markets because that's where their headquarters are and that's where they started. So, so, so as an interesting portion of this, very few people knew that Asmodee even owned Miniature Market. I think, I think it's mostly the industry that knew about it and like, you know, gamers who listen to people like us because they don't advertise that. And some very keen-eyed people during a presentation that Asmodee did about two years ago, two and, and a half years Eric ago. Eric Martin, one of them. <laughs> Eric Martin was one of them. <laughs> Stephen Bonacore might have been yeah. one of them. And some on, other online people said they were looking at this, um, the, the, uh, the presentation that, what's his, uh, the, the, the CEO, uh, um, Stefan? Carvel, I think, is this? They will look at the yes. presentation he was making up to um, up to the Embracer Group, and there was this little logo for Miniature Market saying "just acquired" or something like that, and everyone was like, "What?" And then all was, you know, they never actually talked about it, as far as I know, in any other release or anything like that. They wanted it to go below the radar because you don't, you know, you know to the public. Obviously, there is a conflict of interest on something, but they're just selling everyone's game. So they're just a retailer of all games, of course, especially their games. So that I thought was a very, very interesting thing. Oh, and the point is of this, uh, and like the little inside, there were some employees that were um, left Asmodee, um, possibly due to the restructuring. They left Asmodee, and they are the ones who are buying Miniature Market and going to be running it. Sounds like they're going to be running it out of France because they're the names are all French names. So that's where they and that's where they're from and that's where they were laid off from or let or left. So very interesting. Um, as a day, not acquiring but selling a company. I think that I think that the, one of the two individuals is going to live in the United States. I think they're already here. There uh, you go. But uh, yeah, it was actually kind of a, a interesting because the press release changed initially. It said that uh, mentioned the uh, partners Asmodee and Embracer and then that was removed later because I read it the email as soon as I basically got it that morning I'm like wow and uh, Scott misunderstood me and thought I was saying uh, Asmodee was sold I'm like I never said that uh, I don't know but it was you know it's one of those things where we're both doing something else when I mention it yeah. but uh, yeah it's pretty it's pretty interesting you know because you'd think that'd be a good business to be in but maybe maybe retail's tough you know I mean it yeah. probably is I mean, look at you know CSI, right? Cool Stuff Inc. Uh, obviously, they exited the market under under pressure. They couldn't compete anymore with all of the others. With between Amazon, Miniature Market, Noble Knight, uh, it's at least in one or two more that are you know have a share of the U.S. based online retailing market. Um, it, it is a very hard market. It's a hard market for your friendly local game store. It's just as hard a market for your friendly online game store. Oh, well, it's definitely, a de I'm, I'm certain it's got to be challenging, right? Because they, yeah. the expectation is to discount the games. So, and I'm sure Asmodee was discounting brand new games that, you know, Miniature Market was discounting their games and, you know, they have a right. minimum price that they, retail price that they want stuff to be sold at. Right, right. Um, I have one more quick one. Uh, this is a, when Bonacore's worlds collide, collide. story. So NASA... And I'm a huge space nerd, if you guys don't know, but people who hear me online. Well, we knew, we knew that you were a huge nerd. So Nerd, <laughs> nerd, but I'm a huge space nerd and, of course, gaming nerd. So NASA, of all people, has released a D&D &D 5E compatible that. campaign to save the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's, it's just so weird that, I mean, it's just, cause guess what? At NASA... You got a bunch of gaming nerds, surprisingly enough. There is a crossover between the, this nerddom going on here. So they released this campaign uh, free. You can just, if you, um, if this came out on Dicebreaker, you can go there to look for the article. Or you can just probably Google NASA D&D &D 5E campaign and Hubble, and it'll come up. Um, basically, a, a, a gaming module if you want to play. You know, with fantasy tropes, I think they, they look like they were all fantasy kind of characters. You have to, or space-based characters, and you have to go out and figure out what has happened to the Hubble Space Telescope. It just disappeared. So my worlds collided right there, and I love that. Uh, I love that story. And that's all I got. I Thank would you. say that is the weirdest story I've ever heard, except 
a couple years ago. It wasn't five E D and D, but do you remember they did that Wendy's did that uh, RPG campaign where you are battling? It's they never say it's McDonald's, but it's McDonald's. You know? Oh, really? No, I do not remember this. Oh, yeah, it's uh, is- oh, it was called Feast of Something. But yeah, I was gonna say this is the weirdest thing. No, wait, no, that was the weirdest thing I've ever heard. But this is pretty up there. <laughs> this is this is this is nerddom, geekdom on both sides. Uh, I, I don't really care about the burger wars really in this country. I don't need yeah, to. Yeah. That CIA game too a while back as well, wasn't it? Wasn't it CIA? Oh, something like that. Yeah, it's Remember it's that. interesting when that happens, and I think they had some game people involved in that too. You know, um, very cool. Yeah, there was also oh, that's just fun. the that, that's fun news. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the Lego Dungeons and Dragons set that was announced just announced. It yeah, has an adventure in it made by Wizards of the Coast. Yeah, so you could that is I, awesome. Play. I saw a lot of people posting. Three hundred sixty was the, uh, the the out for them. <laughs> it's Lego. It's expensive. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what Lego cost. So, well, but they're doing a minifigure line too. Yeah. So. It's but awesome. they actually, they, they actually, in all of that, I think we didn't we talk about it here. I, I definitely talked about this on my podcast that they are actually re- releasing Lego games now. They and they're actually going to be real games. Uh, Has again Hasbro and Lego have gotten together to do real games, not like the crap that they they did some in the past. <laughs> I have, I have a copy good. of Creationary that I've since deconstructed and gave all the pieces to my kids. But <laughs> hey, I'm allowed to say crap because those games are crap. But the <laughs> But they were allegedly, yeah. they, they, allegedly these games are going to be like, you know, really designed by like game designers and stuff like that. So using your Lego pieces, I don't know much about them, but I look forward to seeing and hearing more about them. Yeah. None of this can a chump doing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, as I was saying, we just got back from Texas Pinball Festival, which is not board games, but it has been evolving. Um, one of the big things that uh, debuted a few years back was uh, Insider Connected with Stern Games, and it's an app that basically game beyond gamification, right? Where you are getting achievements and badges as you're doing uh, playing the game, and you make sure you log in. So I was trying to do. Uh, there's one. They have all these achievements: how many games you played, um, but one is consecutive days that you played the game. And you can only see how many other people have made that achievement once you've achieved it, and or the badge. It's not an achievement. And I was like on day 106 because I want to just get to 120 because I believe I'm certain it goes beyond that. And uh, when I achieved, uh, when I made that badge for 100 uh, 90, which was the previous level, there was only like 326 other people that had done it at the time. Uh, and so then I had a very busy day just before we left. And I woke up in the middle of, my, middle of the night. I'm like, I don't think I played a game. And I looked at the app and it says 100, 100, uh, st- longest streak 106, uh, current streak 106. I'm like, oh, I guess I did. I don't really think so. Then I played the next morning. It's like uh, longest streak 106, current streak one, one day. I'm like, oh, no. I mean, I loved it, though, because it was encouraging me to play regularly, which was, uh, was awesome. But what's really cool is they actually had a game come out last uh, at the end of the year last year uh, called Venom, based on the Venom comic books. And they actually use the app to basically make it a campaign where you keep playing the game and you keep growing and increasing your abilities. And then you, it makes you so that you uh, everybody can ach- meet the final boss. You just have to do it by experience instead of just making it in one game. You know, somebody could do that. A, a, a great player can play it in 30 minutes and probably be done. But a, a, a not so great player can make it just by playing the game regularly and expanding you, uh, your abilities. Um, the neat thing is they are doing more and more stuff. There is rumors uh, of a deeper game. I, I, there, I can mention it. Everybody's mentioning d and I don't believe that uh, maybe that'll happen. Um, but I, I would never put any uh, investment, anything in, in whatever they come in because the, they really do keep it secret. But they do have a new game, Jaws. And what Jaws does is, is of course, based on the movie, um, you are increasing, I don't know exactly what the goal is, but you're increasing your level of fish. You start off as a sardine, and yeah, and now I'm, I think I'm a mackerel now. Uh, and you're collecting teeth, and as you get more teeth, you get Jaws. And, uh, and but the, the great thing is in this one, you go in, um, 
Scott actually had it happen within the game. You could play uh, Shark Attack, which is in Jaws, the movie, where you're attacking sharks. So they re they replicated on the LCD screen in the background, and you use your flippers like left and right to shoot the specific arrows, and then both of them to shoot straight ahead. Exactly. Uh, it's we're not uh, we're not seals, and um, you're you're doing the flippers to do these uh, to shoot. But the really cool thing is you can spend teeth to play that game in a standard mode. And, you know, with because uh, there's actually ways to change the way you play the game. So you know, it does have rules. There are layering of things that you can do. It's a set collection and all kinds of things in all these games. And but what's really great is it's also in 3D. So you, they give you 3D glasses with the game, so you can play that shark game in 3D. I did not get to do that. Um, wow. And uh, it's pretty slick. And so they're they're. We know one designer, uh, 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 actually uh, in, uh, programmer and rules design game, game design guy. He is a gamer. He designed the game Nobleman that came out from um, Tasty Minstrel like 10 or 12 years ago. And so he's way into that game aspect of all of this stuff. And he's uh, really pushing, helping push uh, this insider connected thing, which is cool because it helps get people out. Um, some of the things, so badges are... Um, sometimes for specific games. So like in January, they, they targeted uh, an Elvira game, pinball game called Elvira House of Horrors. And you, if you don't have that game and you want to get those badges, you need, you need to go to locations to play. So it's kind of interesting where it's encouraging people to play uh, more often and go to uh, locations to play the games. And of course they have leaderboards and things like that, uh, that are, are, it's pretty awesome. Um, but the whole event was awesome and a lot of homebrew stuff. Saw some really fantastic games. Go ahead, Steve. I, I, I don't know why you didn't tell me about this. I need I need reasons to come out to Dallas, by the way. I mean, I love Dallas and it's and, and see you and, and and Scott and everybody. Well, you'll, uh, you'll so be there. Make it's, sure I know next year when, you, when you're doing it's this. It's in March. I'll, I'll it's the out. downer. Uh, it's, uh, last year it was like one week away. I think we, 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 got, we left and then we came back to Dallas a week later to go to the gathering. So... Um, it's it's a it's a tough timing, but it's really great. It's I'm writing this um, down. I don't know. There's a big big uh, exp, uh, uh, pinball expo in Chicago, of course, which is the home of pinball. Um, I've never been to that event, uh, and I know people that have, of course. But many feel that this is a great show. And one of the things that they do is you get free admission to the show if you bring pinball machines. And so they had over 450 machines um, that were from the fans not just the publishers, right? Wow. And so uh, the manufacturers. And so, uh, and it's all free play. So it's it's pretty amazing. It's very loud though. Nikki uh, OD'd and had, uh, on the sound and had to leave early. Saturday night is the uh, after the fair X part where people that work the fair get to actually go play the games. Cause you know, um, last year, I mean, the, the hobby is growing. There's, they actually released like eight games last year and supposedly 10 this year. I don't know that I saw, remember seeing 10. But uh, there was Labyrinth, which is great. It's based on the movie Labyrinth. There was Jaws, as I mentioned. There's a new Looney Tunes machine that's fantastic. There's another one called Texas Chainsaw Massacre. They're both exactly the same mechanical machine, basically. Uh, but the, you know, the uh, toys are designed differently. But they have completely different rule sets, and those are really fun. Uh, I really love Looney Tunes. Um, but IP is, is king, for sure, uh, the, uh, in, in pinball. So it's not like... Um, it used to be where you'd play a weird game that was just some space theme or whatever uh, and could be a fantastic game. But uh, it was still great and uh, really, really amazing and very loud. Um, <laughs> so let's get to the games that we've played. Um, Derek has not, has not had any news, has not had any exciting ex stuff, but he can start with a game that he's played. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I uh, <clears throat> I also went to an incredible gaming venue uh, over the weekend called Board Game Arena. Hey, um, and, <laughs> and, owned by Asmodee. Um, owned by I was just gonna say that owned by Asmodee. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, hashtag not sponsored. Um, and uh, <laughs> we, uh, and uh, uh, Steph Hodge. And Michael Aldridge taught me the Great Split, uh, which is designed by uh, Yalmar Hawk and Lorenzo Silva, uh, and it's published originally published by Horrible Guild. Um, and I, I, yeah, I, I've never played uh, 
I didn't know anything about this game other than it was in the board game Similo promotional deck that they put out at Essen a couple of years ago. So this is the only that's the only thing I recognized about it. And um, it's one of those I split you choose games, which for me and my expectations for this going in were not very high because I, I for me I split you choose is kind of like how many different iterations of that can you do? I I own two games that have that. I have a New York Slice and Sunday Split. And they're kind of like, in my mind, sometimes they're kind of both the same game, just one smaller <laughs> than the other. Um, but but the Great Split is a little bit different, where there's kind of, uh, a, like, the values of things can change for you individually. So what's going on is you will start with some cards, and there is a pool. You're all, like, thematically, I wasn't entirely, like, tapped into what's thematically going on. You're all, like, super wealthy people and you're buying artwork and uh, uh, busts and paintings and things, and, like, there's tomes. And, I, yeah, thematically, I wasn't quite, like, tracking with what is really going on, but you're, you're, all, you're, you're all various forms of Scrooge McDuck and spending money. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, but what's, what's unique about this is you're given cards that all basically have icons on that will have you adjust you know values on tracks for your player board and across different things and there's like there's artwork and there's tomes and then there's jewels and there's also just coins in general which can in a way help you like overall you're each given like a an identity card that has where you you you're, you start off with a few pegs on some category so you all start in, in different positions so you're not all starting exactly the same and you also have kind of i don't want to call them goals it's just kind of like incentives to chase certain things you know you, it'll be easier for you to score points in certain categories but what you do is for the i split you choose you have uh, a number of cards and you have to divvy them up and you, uh, if you're playing the physical version, you would have a card that you split the uh, you know, the two. You create two stacks of cards and then divide them with this card. You put it in an envelope and then you pass it to your to the neighboring player. And on BGA, I can't remember if it's to your left or to the right. It was you know to the next player, <laughs> um, and uh, and then they get to make a decision of the two sets of cards you sent them. They keep one, send the other back to you. And then, of course, you are passing an envelope where you get to choose one of the two stacks that are given to you. And then you basically get, you know, the one uh, that didn't get chose from what you sent and the one you chose from the envelope that got sent to you. And then you, you, you increase the pegs on your board and move everything up in value. And you're chasing kind of like multipliers and things. It was... It was very interesting. It was like more elaborate than most I split you choose games that I've played, and it, like it, it, it stood out to me, and I, I really enjoyed it. And it might be, I guess I've only played it once, but it might be my new favorite. Neat. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Have you new ever favorite played this period game or new favorite? No, 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 no. Oh, sorry, new favorite oh, I split right. you choose game. Yeah. Okay. Is like I said, it, it, for yeah. me, it's kind of like deck building. It's kind of like how many of those in your collection do you need? Like one or two? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they might scratch different itches though. Yeah, I yeah, agree. but I but the so this was the great split from Horrible Guild, and uh, I really dug it. I, anybody else played this yet? I have. I had played like a half dozen it. times. Oh, oh, wow. yeah, I played it a bunch. It goes uh, three to seven players. It works. Yeah, it, 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 it's it's simultaneous. We played counts. with five, and it was yeah, it, it it moves along pretty quick. Yeah, in person it moves along as well because everything is simultaneous. It's not too difficult. You're often making splits. You're looking at what the next player is. Oh, they're trying to collect books. Well, do I want to give them like this measly book offer and keep good stuff for myself if they don't choose it or they will take it? And so cards right. shift around the table slowly. Sometimes you pass stuff and you get it right back, which you want. And you pass it again, you get it right back. And so you can like maximize that stuff. And sometimes it just... Oh. It's Steph awesome. Hodge was my neighbor, and she was capitalizing on stars, which are just kind of like straight up points in the game. And uh, it was it was very funny because I apparently I was like the only player that started the game with books in their hand, of course. And by the way, that's the other thing too. After you make these choices, the cards don't get discarded. You get like a new card added to your hand every turn. But the same cards, you get to kind of keep making stacks with some of the same stuff. Like stuff doesn't just all go away and you get all new stuff like like you do in most games. So it's kind of interesting. When I started off being like the only player that had books, 
it basically meant that me and the two players next to me had a, had a chance to score the tomes, but like everyone else for the first couple turns didn't see books at all, <laughs> you know? And so it has that seven wonders issue where it's like, yes, it plays a lot of players, but really you're only interacting with your neighbors. Right. Yeah. You can only affect that. <laughs> In a way, although not all the cards come into play, and of course with smaller player count, it's even less. So then you're like, you yeah. may have a game with very little of something. And hopefully you suss that quickly and you're just like, oh, that, that's never going up. You pass those. <laughs> you're right. Yeah. I don't but, know. Uh, yeah, nice. It was very enjoyable. Where'd you play, Steven? So at Dice Tower West, the game of the convention, I mean, well, for me, uh, was something that Corey Thompson found. And it was from this completely unknown little publisher who is also the designer, him and his wife of the whole company. And it is called Expressions. And oh, yeah, I heard about this, this game. Okay. So this game is absolutely amazing. Uh, 15 minutes, it says on the box, let's call it 20, two to five players. What do you do in, your, in any game where, where we have cards and we're competing? Uh, and we're playing cards for trick taking or for whatever we're doing, we're playing cards. We're trying to figure out poker, everything. We're trying to figure out, well, what do you have in your hand, right? That's sort of the thing. Well, what do you have and what do, you th what do I think you're going to play? Well, take just that, and this is the game com com um, cooperatively. Cooperatively, we're trying to figure out the cards in each other's hands. On your turn, you can do one of two things. You either can guess a card, which obviously in the beginning is kind of dumb, right? Because <laughs> you just have a hand of cards and everyone has it. You can't guess, oh, you have the, you know, the three of uh, the red three. I should mention there are five colors, five suits, one to 10, 50 cards in the game. So I can't make a guess early, but I'm going to give a, they call it a suggestion, a clue. And I'm going to show a card and I'm going to put it in front of me. And if I put it in this orientation with this facing out, I'm saying... This is my lowest card in red. That's not so great information if they go up to 10. But if I put it like this, this is my highest card in red, which means by definition, I have either the one or the two or both. If I put it this way, it says that this is the only red card. I have no more red cards in my hand. And if I put it this way, I have more threes in my hand. Every time you give a clue, it's a negative point. You're looking to score as collectively a po positive points. So if I put a clue down in the end, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be agony. Oops, <laughs> this side. It's going to be agony points. If I guess correctly, it's going to be harmony points. In fact, when you guess correctly, you get two harmony points positive points. And if you guess incorrectly, you're going to get two negative points. And then the, the, the cards come out of like your, if I guess Derek, you have, you know, the, you have the red, the green too. And I was right. Derek would take it it's out of his hand, blind. put it, put, yeah, he would, <laughs> it's colorblind friendly. You would put it on the harmony side. And then I would also be able to put in any card on the harmony side. If I guess wrong, wherever that card was in anybody else's hand, it would come out, go to the agony side and and then another another card from my hand will go to agony so it's about simply trying to figure out via those clues and there's only four different kinds of clues you can give in the game what everybody has 50 card all the cards are used some of them are used as a timer in the game so like in a five player game you get nine cards and there's five rounds so that's five more cards that'll turn over and they all go to agony every card that's shown except for guest cards, are all going to go to agony. Um, so you need to score 26 harmony points to win the game, right? 25 would be a split, zero, zero, you know, 25 positive, 25 negative. I don't know. It's a draw, I guess. You need to score 26. The best score that I saw that anybody got, that, that we got, because I played this game a lot over there, at least five times, six times there, and, and a few times since, uh, was 30. So a 30 with 20 negative. So... 10 points. And that's a pretty darn good score when you think you've got to put down negative, you got to put down clues or else you can't, you can't do this. Small game by uh, Isaac 
Myers, Isaac Meyer, uh, Red. Uh, sorry, not Red. Barn made Barn. games. Barn made. Barn yeah. made games. Uh, big shout out. Really smartly, smartly done. I'm going to give another quick shout out to Kabanga, which is still pleasing. We found this game over at BGG Con by Amigo Games. This game is going to be nominated for Spiel des Jahres this year. I'm telling you right now, boys and girls, <laughs> this game is the one of the best filler games you can have for for two to six players, three to six, for three to six players. Let's give a big shout out. Constantly hits the table every time we get together. We go, hey, 15 minutes, the game's over. Move on to something else. Or everyone I, wants I to play it Kabanga again. It's so much at- fun. Yeah, I played Kabanga at BGG Con the, uh, this last November, and uh, it, it, the Kabanga became like part of our lexicon for the rest of the evening. Oh yeah, games. so it's like, oh, that's a Kabanga. <laughs> yeah, it says in the rules for Kabanga that you take the card um, when you when you without go, I, I imagine you have to play cards in, into the correct rows for this game, uh, and there's four, uh, four colors, uh, which are the suits, and the cards go one to 18, and you gotta play it. And if if there's a gap between the cards on either side of the color, of, of, of red, for instance, if anybody has a card between those, you're supposed to throw the card at the player and say, Kabanga, and then they draw cards. But to avoid eye injury, it's probably a bad idea. I, when I first sat down and played this at BGG Con, Literally, everybody else had glasses on it, and we were reading the rules. I'm like, wait a second. And I grabbed my sunglasses. I put them on. Okay, okay. We can throw cards. You're safe now. My eyes are now protected. Yeah. But this game is this game is a, just the best filler game that you can possibly have in your collection. Highly recommended. Amigo, hit it out of the park. And then the only other thing. My notes from Gamma point out. Kabanga hits the U.S. market in June from Amigo. Nice. Yeah, uh, I, I was going to say it's a it's a Gen Con release, but it probably is. Uh, they're probably a little ahead of schedule. Amigo is giving me has already given me. It's sitting on the chair next to me, f- uh, like forty copies of this for Podfather the Cruise, which is coming up soon, and they're sponsoring the cruise. They're very nice people. Alex, big shout out to Alex. They are sponsoring. Hashtag sponsoring Podfather. Anyway, uh, the only other thing I'll mention is uh, that I got to play War of the Ring, my number one game in the world, twice at at Dice Tower West. I won versus a very experienced player, and I lost to a newbie, which I thought was great. I, mean, I wanted to give the newbie a really good experience, so I made sure I explained everything I was doing, everything he was doing. So it was it was really, really good. Um, oh, and Thunder Road Vendetta, which I've talked about here recently. I think I played it five times. That game still just cannot make me smile and laugh more. I love Thunder Road Vendetta by Restoration Games. Cool. That's- hey, Eric, what have you got to tell us? I thought you were going to show a game so, you played on a notepad. <laughs> no, just I'm also just updating the database. I'm getting release dates from all the publishers and what's coming out when. And like I've written about Kabanga before, but now I'll update, put in the release dates, Eric. get all that info. It's like this info filter. I just funnel down through me. So by chance, I also have a game with 50 cards. Uh, I'm going to get expressions. That sounds awesome. That is so my taste. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I can mention scorecards out from our R&R games designed by Mike Fitzgerald. This is a oh, game that is only cards. I played this in a prototype form in 2022. It was super rough at that time. Yeah. Now we got the published version. So the deck has 50 cards. They come in four colors. There's two of each blue card and one of everything else, right? And every card has a power on it that tells you how it scores. Every card scores, often in weird ways and sometimes just very straightforward ones like this. Score four points for every 10. So each player starts with five cards in hand. There's one card face up on the table. You're going to play cards in turn around the table until all of you have played five cards. You draw a new card after each time you play. So each time you play a card, it's going to score based on what's visible on the table. So you're trying to make combos and work off what other people are playing in order to maximize the score. So it's like this sort of friendly playing because, you know, if someone keeps doing blue, you keep doing a number, this, that, and the other. So trying to do that. So it's all special power cards come into play. You play four rounds. Again, cards just carry over. And so 
you can plan somewhat based on what you have in hand. I'm going to play this first, then this and this, and then you draw something else. You're like, okay, where can I fit this in? Only play five cards, score after four rounds, you're done. Super simple, but it's combo-y. There is uh, zero theme. Yeah, Derek, you want to talk about no theme? Score <laughs> <laughs> cards. That is a themeless <laughs> named game. Every card scores. It like just repeats what's here. That's it. <laughs> it's colors. I have to say, the name of that game sounds like when a TV show wants to like have a game featured in a scene and they need to call it something. And it's like, <laughs> you, you want to play scorecards? <laughs> yeah. That's right. You want to play board game? <laughs> I like that name. I would like but I mean, Every it tells you. It sounds great though. That's awesome. And then it tells you as well in French and Spanish as well. So, Of course. There you go. Although the cards are only in English. Hmm. Hmm. That's weird. Rules in French and Spanish, cards only English. Hmm. Okay. What's the exp explanation of how to, what it is? But it has uh, but it has iconography. It looks it looks like you could get past it, Yes. I mean I a lot of it is again, you're just it's like the way that I can learn games in German because I know enough German just to read German rules, mostly, not entirely. I'll stumble on things, but it'll be enough to be like, you deal this and you score this and you put, you know, popples here and roll the riffle and whatever. Werfel. Werfel the riffle. Werfel the werfel. Well, cool. Yes. We played, yeah, um, Nikki had been pushing to play Art Society for ages, and we finally got to play it uh, a little, a couple weeks back. And it is a, of course, it is a tile laying game. Nikki is a big fan of tile laying games, and that's why she wanted to play it. But the interesting thing about this game is um, you are all like trying to get pieces of art that will have some sort of a pairing or uh, colors. Like, so this tile here is a, a red tile, meaning it's a red piece of art, which I guess is portraiture. And you want to group them. Uh, not necessarily by t by type, but by frame. So you want art pieces of art that have the same frame nearby so that you can gain extra tiles that fill little holes that you have. So you're, you're trying to cover as much of the board as you can. There's no, it's unlikely you'd probably cover it all. Um, and you also want to cover these minus points. And I think you want to cover these stars. I don't remember exactly what the story was on that. Maybe it was to give you additional, uh, the little, these little tiles, I don't recall. But the premium spot is this blue, light blue band. That's where the the cards, the, the pieces of art are more value because that's at eye level. And you're, you're doing a whole, um, the scoring is as pieces get put onto the, uh, the board, they increase that type of art value. Now, the, the range is, that's upside down, uh, the range is not uh, that huge. It's two times, three times, four times, five times, uh, plus there's a bonus for the ones that are in the, uh, the band. And it's really quite good. Uh, Dave was not into it uh, initially, and once we played it, we all had a great time. It's really challenging though, because what happens is, Lots of pick, lots of paintings get dumped into like the uh, archives, uh, and you want some of those paintings, but it's very difficult to get them out of the archives. And I don't think maybe Dave pulled it off or Nikki. I never was able to do it because you can't. I think you can't play it. Like you don't want. Um, you actually lose value if you have something that is adjacent that is the same type of painting. So the different styles we have. Uh, are like landscape and uh, uh, still life and uh, buildings. I mean, this is the, you know, the construction workers. Uh, and it is actually quite a bit, bit of stuff and it's quick. You bid on the, um, you each have a, a set of paddle cards to bid. Oops, there they all go in my lap. Um, <laughs> you got, got a set of paddle cards that you bid and you know, whoever wins has the uh, highest value card. and you know, you, you think, so there was a bunch of it when we played it where we were kind of like, Dave, I think, started with the lowest value card and just kept going up. There is a little bit more to it than that. And sometimes you're really desperate to win something, so you will bid higher. Um, and then you want to kind of keep track of what the other ones are bidding so that you hope that you can claim uh, something you really, really want. But it's really quite a great game, and it is absolutely beautiful. 
Um, really nice production. It's from uh, Mighty Boards, and it's designed by Mitch Wallace, I think, not my Martin Wallace. Uh, but uh, it was, it was. I think they debuted it at um, at Spiel, and we actually, I know they de debuted it. I think we had a copy of it before that. But that's how long we, Nikki's been waiting to play it. Uh, but it was quite enjoyable and had a great time with it. Uh, we also played a couple of other fun games. Um, and I think we put the episode out. I know we put the episode out for the Pick a Pen, which we really love. That's coming from Amigo soon as well. That's a, a, a roll and write kind of a thing where you're rolling pencils that are your dice. Really, really cool. Um, anybody else have anything they want to add? April release for Pick a Pen. April release for, uh, for Pick a Pen. Cool. And of course, it's, Eric knows yeah, that. It, cool. It's already out uh, in, uh, in the same page. Course. It's from That's 999 Games, but Amigo's doing it in U.S. and Germany. Yeah. Well, cool. Excellent. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining me today. I'm, I hope you guys had fun. Uh, we'll be Absolutely. back again next month. I'm not certain. Next month's a busy month. I uh, got the eclipse. Uh, uh, both Stephen and I are uh, planning. I'm going to be in Texas for it, and Stephen's going to be in New York for it. So, I'm going to be uh, in Niagara Falls for it. That'll That's be right. fun. Uh, but it's amazing. Like It's a big swath of the country that is going to be able to see it right through there, you know. I'm, I'm eager to see how it all goes out. Uh, I've I never seen wait. a total eclipse, I don't think. So Very few people have. It's usually, you know, in yeah, rural areas and yeah. stuff. So this is this is the will be the largest number of people who have the ability to see it. It's going through all these uh, Austin, San Antonio, at least very close to it, Dallas, St. Louis, maybe, uh, Indianapolis, Buffalo, Niagara. It's a lot of very populated area so kind of cool yeah it'd be interesting wow. and uh make sure i have my eclipsers so i can actually look at it I, I won't squint and look at it i have bought 60 pairs of those glasses they were not they were very <laughs> cheap but they're but they're certified for like you you yeah, certified you won't go blind <laughs> you will not go blind uh so if if you happen to be up in niagara i can give you a pair were I they five have, bucks no the, the whole yeah joking. the whole pack the whole pack was like, you know, like $50 or something. I wanted to just have them to give them out to everybody. Sure, sure. Well, hopefully you have some extras when you're done uh, for your next Eclipse experience. <laughs> 2049, I think. I'm not sure that's going to happen. <laughs> well, cool. Everybody have a great one. We'll see you again next month. And thanks for joining us. Bye, everybody. Bye.